Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Cambridge English Teach Cambridge University Press English Language Teaching webinar. I'm very pleased to welcome Pauline Cullen as our speaker for today. Pauline has taught in the UK, Spain, Hong Kong, and Australia, and has been working for Cambridge English since 1995. She's been involved in writing five Cambridge titles, Cambridge Grammar for the IELTS, Common Mistakes for IELTS Intermediate, Cambridge Vocabulary for IELTS, Cambridge Advanced Vocabulary for IELTS, and the new Cambridge Official Guide to IELTS. Over to you, Pauline. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Alistair. Can everybody hear me okay? Can you hear me okay, Alistair? Yes? Okay, great. Yes, I'll get started. <laughs> Okay, hello everyone and thank you for joining us and giving up your evening or morning. Um, here it's early evening in Brisbane, Australia, which is where I am. Um, and today's webinar is called How to Improve Your Students' IELTS Score. Alistair commented that we're 95% of you are teachers, which is great. Um, and I'm hoping that this small percentage of students will find it useful as well. When I was preparing this, I realized that trying to cover everything in 45 minutes was actually quite an ambitious undertaking. And I'm conscious that this is a lot of information to take in in one sitting. So I hope you don't find it overwhelming. This is my first webinar, so I'm hoping it will go smoothly. But I know the session's being recorded, so remember you'll be able to watch it again later if you miss anything. Now, earlier you were asked some poll questions. I don't know if you answered those. They all relate to specific parts of the test. So I'm going to deal with each of those as we work through the individual skills that they relate to. OK, in this webinar, I'm going to begin by talking about your approach to IELTS, both from the learner and the teacher point of view. Then we'll look at the four macro skills. Um, so that's reading, listening, writing, and speaking. And which, with each of these, I'll talk about what skills you need to practice, how to approach using language, uh, sorry, using te test materials with students who are bands four or five, and ways of exploiting those test materials to make sure you're using or making the most out of the resources that you've got. My approach here was to look at how I would personally teach a class of lower level uh, students if I was preparing them for an arts test. And I'll also be referring to our new title just out that Alistair just referred to, the Cambridge Official Guide to IELTS. It's a very comprehensive guide to the IELTS test and it's divided equally into a skills section and a practice test section. And my role in this book was writing the skills section, which is the first half of the book. OK, so if I was beginning an IELTS preparation course with a group of students, I'd start with this question. How do you see the IELTS test? Do the test can shape the way students prepare for it? And in this image, the student sees the test as an obstacle in his path. And the problem with seeing the test this way is that preparation often involves looking for ways around it or looking for shortcuts. They may tend to look for patterns or ways they can guess answers. They may think they can just memorize some writing task answers and use those. It's a complete waste of time. And worse than that, it takes up valuable learning time. Another problem with this image is that the whole focus is only on the test itself rather than on language learning. And that's not desirable either for the language classroom or in terms of making genuine progress. This next slide shows some common strategies that students and teachers might use to prepare for the test. If you ask a student, they often say they're doing lots of practice tests. I knew one student whose approach was to keep taking the test until his score improved, and he was quite disappointed when he received the same score every time. Teachers who are new to the IELTS test might prepare their class by giving them practice tests and going over the answers. As you can see here, these are pretty unhelpful strategies when it comes to increasing your IELTS score. Looking for patterns or shortcuts and only taking tests means that you go around in circles and essentially just stay in the same place. It's much more helpful to see the test like this. In this image, you can see that the IELTS test is a marker that tells you how far you've come in your language learning. If you begin by getting your students to see the test this way, it can have a positive effect on the way that they approach their preparation. 
taking this analogy a little further, you could see the IELTS test as a sort of GPS. In the test, the students need to give off very clear signals to show where they are. And the aim of your course is to show them how to do that, as well as to guide them along this path in terms of advancing their English language level. You can also see from this that the student who kept taking the test over and over was basically standing in one spot and repeatedly asking, where am I? Which is why he got the same answer in his test score. The problem with this image is that walking is a little bit too simple a skill to master. So I'll give you another an analogy now. So in terms of learning and teaching, I think it's better to see your preparation for the test like this. So it's a little bit like learning to swim. The students need to learn all the skills that will help them stay afloat. They may begin by splashing about and not looking very elegant, but gradually they'll build up different skills more sophisticated aspects like style and speed and distance. Another useful thing about this analogy is that it shows the students at every level are all having to cope with the same element and that at times the lower levels will feel out of their depth. I think it's also important to point out that the higher levels shouldn't think that they no longer need to focus on basic skills and we'll be talking about that again later. Now, I said earlier that you shouldn't simply take tests or do practice tests, but that isn't to say they aren't important. Um, test practice helps to increase familiarity with the test and to improve timing, which is a really important part of each paper in the test. And both of these together help build confidence. So these are the main reasons to do test practice, not as a language learning tool. I'd just like to look at some questions I've been asked in the past about IELTS. The first one was by a student, actually one of my followers on Twitter, and they asked, what if I don't understand a word in the question? And this person was specifically talking about the writing test. You could imagine that's a real concern for band four or five candidates. Teachers have asked me this second question, why does IELTS have so many different types of questions? These teachers are probably thinking in terms of making life simpler in the classroom. And they're also perhaps seeing the tasks and questions as simply exercises to complete. So in answer to the student's question, I'd point out that the IELTS test is written with some key aims in mind. And one of these is to be fair. This means that it's designed to make sure that candidates in the lower bands have every opportunity to show off what they know. So they should go into the test trusting that the questions are there to help them to do that. The answer to the teacher's question is that the test also aims to be valid, accurate, and reliable. So what do we mean by valid? And what is a valid test or measure of reading skills, for example? Well, first it's important to realize that referring to four skills is a little bit too simplistic. In reality, these are divided up into numerous subskills. So a valid reading test score that's accurate and reliable will measure all of those subskills. Test validity means you also consider the purpose of the test. IELTS is a test that's often used as a proof of language level for university study. So the skills being tested need to reflect the skills required for university study. The next thing you also have to consider is the washback effect on the classroom. And by that, I mean the different questions have a direct impact on a test preparation course. And you can imagine that a test with a wide range of task types has a much more positive washback effect on a class than a test that only contains multiple choice questions, for example, especially if you consider any a key class. So the different question types help to make sure that the test is valid, accurate, and reliable. And I think it's important to begin a course with this in mind, because again, it can shape the way that you prepare and the strategies that you use. Okay, now we'll go on to look at the different skills in some detail and the different parts of the test. So first of all, I'll begin with reading skills. So what specific skills do the candidates need to develop in order to do well in the test? 
Well, this was the question I had to ask myself in order to write the skills section of the new book. And it helps if you see the question types as having a clear purpose, which is to force candidates to use specific skills in order to complete the task. This is how it measures those skills. So I worked backwards from the different sections of the reading test and the different question types. Here's a look at the skills we identified, and this is the contents page from the reading skills section of the new book. And as with the test, you can see that the units progress from more straightforward, straightforward surface level reading skills, uh, for example, scanning a passage for a specific detail, and dealing with descriptive, descriptive passages, which is what they'll find in reading section one, onto things like understanding how ideas are connected to each other, and identifying opinion and attitude, and doing that in longer, more argumentative or discursive texts, which is what they'll find in reading section three. It's really important, I think, to start with developing skills like these before you move on to test practice. These skills are really the swimming aids, the flotation devices, if you like, that they can call upon throughout the test, even with passages when they're feeling out of their depth. If you give them skills like this, then they should be able to perform their best in the test and achieve the best possible score that they can. Okay, on the screen now is an example from the new book. So this is how we introduce um, a specific skill. Here it's skimming a passage and speed reading. And we explain why this is a useful skill and then provide practice. And this is basically how each of the different sub-skills are approached in the book. When it, came, when it comes to the test, I think it also helps to think about how you test understanding of a text or a passage. Basically, you need to assess whether a student can process the information, uh, simply, uh, sorry, processing the information rather than simply repeating it or copying it. Albert Einstein is reported to have said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. And this is essentially what processing information is all about. So the questions on the paper are really a way of putting the information into other simpler words. So once you've introduced all of the skills and begun developing them, you need to think about how to approach the deep waters, if you like, of test practice. If we just go back to our poll questions, we asked you whether you think it's a good idea to read the questions first. And I can't see any feedback on that, but I'm going to persist. <laughs> um, sorry, Alistair, what, did we have some yeah, feedback sorry, on so what people think? Yes. 70% agreed that you should uh, read the questions first in the reading. That's very interesting. OK. OK, so 70% of you think it's a good idea. I don't. <laughs> in my view, you should begin by reading the passage. And any time that I uh, present, uh, I've taught a class in preparation for, for the test, I've always taught them to read first and to begin by reading. And I'll explain why. Um, basically, reading the questions first, I think, tempts them into thinking they might be able to guess some of the answers. I can absolutely promise you they will not be able to do this. We work very hard to make sure it's not possible. It also tempts them to try and answer questions from their own knowledge or experience. And this is the wrong approach because the questions make it very clear that candidates need to answer according to the information in the passage. Reading first also gives them an overall impression of the passage and what it's about and puts the stress back on reading rather than answering questions. Okay, and I think if you start with the questions, it's quite distracting for them. Okay, so I, I believe you should start with, uh, with reading the, pa the passage first very quickly. Um, so they do that in a gist way uh, to get the overall meaning of the passage first. And what that does um, is also helps them to locate things more quickly later on. Okay, so dealing with test practice, with uh, bands four and five students. You need to remember that students at this level are going to need help and support to increase their confidence. But I wouldn't use dictionaries 
um, at this point. That's not the kind of help that you want to give them. The help that you want to give them is the skills. The students need to find a way to rely on the information in the text and the questions to guide them through the passage. And I think it's very common for students in the lower bands to become far too dependent on their dictionary. Using reading skills can help them cope with the text without understanding every word. What you can do to help is to control just how to one materials only until they've become more confident. You can also guide them through the reading stage with what I've called guided reading. And I'll show you exactly what I mean by that in a moment. So here on the screen now is the way that I would um, present test practice materials with the lower levels. So after a guided reading of the whole passage, and as I said, I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that in a moment, I would then introduce them to the first set of questions and discuss them. I'd go through the task with the class, and discuss the skills they might use to find the answers. And I've deliberately used the word test here rather than answer the questions because this is where you're testing those reading skills that you've practiced. And I'd repeat this whole process for each separate task before looking at the answers. I also wouldn't focus on time at this stage, but I would be aware of how long it's taking your class to answer questions. That can be a good indicator of their level and how well they're coping. So. After completing all of the tasks, I will review their answers. And again, I'll give you some pointers on that in a moment. And finally, I'd exploit the test practice materials by studying the language. And this can be done at a later time, maybe even at the end of a week of study. So let's take a look at how all of that would work in practice. Sorry, I've skipped a slide there. <laughs> OK. so. This slide shows the first reading test packet passage from the book. And with higher level students of band six and over, as I said, you could get them to read the passage quite quickly, first of all, perhaps no more than three minutes. And you'd concentrate on speed reading and reading to get the gist or the overall meaning. But with lower bands, especially initially, I think it's better to build up a gradual picture by breaking it into individual paragraphs, like this. So this is what I meant by guided reading. So this is the title and the subheading and the first paragraph of that passage. And you begin by asking your students to look at the title and the subheading. Uh, so here we have the Dover Bronze Age boat. And at this stage, Band four students would probably be itching to open up their dictionary to look up words like Dover or bronze. But if you ask them to look at the subheading, you can see the information they need is right there. It says, a beautifully preserved boat made around 3,000 years ago and discovered by chance in a muddy hole has had a profound impact on archaeological research. So if you ask them the question, how long do you think, how long ago do you think the Bronze Age was, they would hopefully be able to answer. 3,000 years ago. So they should be able to work out uh, from the passage what some trickier words might mean. OK, um, if you look at the first sentence, they, that should help them to work out that Dover is a place in England. And it's really important for students to learn how to get that information from the text and to trust that it's there for them to find. They just need to read. So at this stage, we're just focusing on the overall message and not a detailed reading of the text. That's what you do with the questions. And to help get that overall meaning, um, you could ask them to label each paragraph and decide on what the purpose of it is. For example, is it A, introducing a new idea, or B, giving background information, C, explaining something, adding extra information, giving the opposite view or disagreeing with an idea, is it summarizing previous ideas, and so on. These are just a few suggestions that I, I came up with, but uh, for each passage you deal with, there may well be others that are more suitable. OK, so this paragraph says, it was 1992. In England, workmen were building a new road through the heart of Dover to connect the ancient port and the Channel Tunnel, which, when it opened just two years later, was to be the first land link between Britain and Europe for over 10,000 years. 
A small team from the Canterbury Archaeological Trust, CAT, worked alongside the workmen, recording new discoveries brought to light by the machines. So clearly this paragraph is giving background information. We have no information about the boat at this point, which is the whole, what the whole passage is about, hence the title. Okay, and at the end of the whole passage, after you've worked through each of the different paragraphs, what it was about. And remember that quote from Albert Einstein, the idea is to encourage them to explain what they've read in simpler language. Another advantage, as I said before, to pre-reading the passage like this is that when they come to answering the questions, they can be more efficient in locating the information they need to find more quickly. And it's good to make your students aware that they're learning a skill here, not just completing, completing an exercise. Okay, so by now your students should be ready to look at the first task. And here's the task that goes with this passage. It's a flowchart completion. Right, we talked earlier about test furnace, and this is where that comes into play. For example, question order. And because the candidates only have a limited time to answer the questions, the questions are designed to be as helpful as possible. There aren't any tricks. And this is what helps make it a fair test. Some of you might be a little confused about question order because there are times when the questions are not in the same order as the text. But there is a clear logic to this. And if you have a look at the box on the right, I'll explain it. Basically, the questions are always in the same order as the text for these types of questions. So we have multiple choice, short answer questions, sentence completion, identifying information, and so on. These types of questions direct or send the students to a specific part of the text and ask them to read it in detail. Now, the questions are never in text order for any of the matching um, questions. So this is where students have to find the information within the passage. The task here is to locate it. So logically, these can't simply be in the same order as in the passage. That wouldn't be a reliable test of this reading skill. So examples of that are matching paragraph headings um, or the locating information items. Okay, and the last type of questions are sometimes in the same order as the passage, and sometimes they aren't. It might seem com confusing, uh, but it isn't. <laughs> um, these include notes completion, summary completion, diagram completion, and so on. And the reason these are only sometimes in the same order as the passage is because these are all ways of taking the information that's in the passage and presenting it in a new and different way. If we look at this task here, it's a flowchart completion. So you can see the information is clearly organized according to date. But in the passage, the information may not be described in chronological order. So the flowchart has rearranged it. So there is a, a logic to, to those types of questions and the question order. OK, so if we look back at the task here, when you're discussing this with the class, you would point out all the helpful information in the questions. So it's asking them to look for key events, and the dates in the flowchart will help them to do this. And again, it's good to teach them that the task itself will guide them through. You might point out how many words they need to write. It's very important for them to stick to this word limit. Let's look at the first question here in detail to see the different reading um, task the different reading skills, sorry, that this task requires, and to get some idea of that washback effect I talked about earlier. Okay, so if you look at this slide, you can see the part of the passage that relates to this first question. So the question says, 1992, the boat was discovered during the construction of a blank. So we need to find something that was being constructed when the boat was found in 1992. And in the passage there, or the part of the passage there over on the right, I've highlighted in yellow the information they would initially scan the passage for. Here it's the year 1992, a mention of something being constructed, and the boat. Now, the boat is first mentioned down here in the second paragraph, where we read, they had found a prehistoric boat. 
So we need to use our reading skills to understand the reference to they, which is referring back to the workmen mentioned in the first sentence at the beginning. Then we need to see that, uh, to see what was being constructed at that time. And there are three possible things that could fit, if you like, in that first paragraph. Uh, there's a mention of a new road, a port, and a tunnel. If we read this part of the text carefully, though, then we realize they were building or constructing a new road, so they need to write road in space. Now, at the review stage, it's important to point out to students that if they write at road or new road, then their answer is incorrect. The task asks for one word only, and the article a uh, is already written in the flowchart. Lower bands tend to struggle to pinpoint the exact information they need, and so asking for a specific number of words helps to determine their reading level. So it is really important for them to check that they follow the instructions that are on the paper. So you can see there are several different reading skills here. They needed to scan for information, they needed to understand referencing, and then they needed to do a detailed reading uh, and to understand paraphrase. And I think to, it's good to bear this in mind when you're teaching a class like this. So it doesn't simply become a matter of focusing on answering questions, and instead the focus is on the skills that they need. And this is what we've tried to stress in the new book. So, after you've completed all of the different task types, you need to review the answers your students have given. I think it's important, again, to focus on skills here rather than on simply right and wrong answers. And in this slide, I've tried to suggest a way to do that. First of all, I'd ask students to rate their own confidence level in their answers. So for each uh, each question, they can assign a number to it from one, I had to guess, to five, I'm sure I'm right. And this is something they could also be doing as they answer the questions. Once you've checked through their answers and gone over any problems, you can use this information to help identify any weak areas they have. For example, did they feel most confident about answering short answer questions? Did they mostly guess the information uh, the identifying information questions, for example. You can then work back from there to target the skills needed for this type of question. So again, the focus is on skills rather than a score. I'd suggest that if they're guessing a large number of Section 1 questions, then they're not ready to move on to Section 2 or 3 level reading passages. Okay, now I said at the start that test practice materials can be a great resource for teaching as well, and they can be exploited in several different ways. For example, here I focused on vocabulary in the first paragraph. And again, it's often best to do this for just a section of the text at a time to make it more effective. I think overloading lower level students can interfere with the amount of information they're able to take in and retain. You might do a matching definitions exercise or even a gap fill exercise where they have to put the correct words back into the test, into the text, sorry. I also find that doing exercises like this helps to jog the student's memory at a later, later stage. So if they're asking what the word archaeology means a few weeks later, you can say something like, do you remember when we looked at the Dover boat passage? And associating words with a specific context or activity can really help them to recall them. Okay, in this next slide, I've focused on referencing within the text. You can ask questions like, what does this word here refer to? And uh, refer them to the which or it. And this can help both with their reading skills and their own writing skills. And here I focus on aspects of grammar. And here on synonyms. And as we've, as we've seen, synonyms and paraphrase are how we use different words to explain a message. And it's how we can test or demonstrate understanding. You could treat something like this as a sort of word search, asking them to find a synonym or a definition of channel tunnel, for example. OK. Now let's move on to look at listening skills. So what skills should you practice? Well, again, these are the skills I identified from the different tasks in the test. And we use these as the framework for each of the units in the listening skills section of the book. 
again, you can see that the units begin with simpler skills like um, identifying and writing numbers and move on to more complex skills such as identifying attitudes and opinions. So these are the types of skills that your students will be tested on and that they need to practice and master for the test itself. Again, it's important to keep the focus on skills rather than on simply answering questions. And in the new book, I try to do this by focusing on the language we use to convey these different types of information. In this example here, you can see that the focus is on the language used to describe a place or a location. And I've tried to show how this would work in any of the four different sections of the test. So the first extract is from a section one. And they need to look at landmarks that are being used. Then they listen and fill in the blanks according to the different locating words and phrases. And then they need to do the same with a section two extract, a section three, and finally a section four extract. So the same skill is being practiced here at each different level. And in this example, the focus is on sections one and three, where the students have to follow a conversation. This is quite a different skill to following a talk, and it's important to focus on what's involved in doing that and to give them plenty of practice. In this particular exercise, they're asked to listen to an extract from the section one, but before they listen, they're asked, okay, if people were discussing this question, which method of transport do they choose? And they're looking at a taxi, a bus, or a car. We've asked them to predict, what do you think they might be, you might be hearing? What information might you be hearing about taxis or buses or cars? And the same with section three, what do the students decide to do? More research, print out their research, or show their notes. What are the advantages and disadvantages of each of those? If people are deciding something, they're going to be discussing that kind of thing. So we're just trying to get them thinking before they listen. Okay, in the listening test, it's really important to actively listen. It isn't a passive activity. And it's a good idea to include some techniques to train your students how to do this. Here are some things I found helpful in the past. And firstly, for this type of activity, it's best to limit yourself to quite short extracts. This helps you to work on or develop recall. Some of the activities you can then get your students to do are things like, um, sorry, listening and repeating what they focus and pay, pay close attention. You could get them to listen and explain what they heard which helps to test or to check their understanding. You can also ask students to listen and write what they hear, again, working only on short extracts. And this can help them to stay focused and to take notes as they listen. So these are just a few ways of training your students to actively listen. Okay, so once you've introduced and practiced all these skills, it's time to look at test practice. And again, I would only tackle sections one and two for band four and five students at the start to build up their confidence at the beginning. So if I were teaching a class, this is how I would approach listening test practice. Unlike the reading test, I would begin by studying the questions. In the test, the candidates are given up to 45 seconds to do this, perhaps a little longer even if there are questions that require more reading. Uh, for example, multiple choice questions in sections three and four, they can need 60 minutes, uh, sorry, <laughs> 60 seconds rather of uh, reading preparation time. So you need to train them to use that time effectively. Studying the questions though is not about trying to answer them before they listen. It helps them to get ready to listen and it helps them to predict the topic and to try to work out how it will progress. This is really important because they only get to listen once. And again, it comes back to test fairness. Another thing to point out is that the questions will always follow the same order as the information in the recording. So again, there are no tricks there. So once you've studied the questions together, I would let them listen and complete the task. And this would be done task by task with your lower bands to break it up, especially if you've got a class that isn't very confident yet. And after you've completed all the tasks, I would then review their answers. And finally, I'd exploit the materials by using the tape script 
to study the language. So let's look at how this would all work. So here's a section three task from the book. Um, as we said, the first approach should be to study the questions and highlight important information to listen for. I've seen students go into a test and highlight almost every word on the page. So it is a skill that they need to practice because it isn't really very helpful to have every word highlighted. Here, I've highlighted the keywords in the questions and I've done this to show how we can predict the topic. So here we can predict that the speakers will discuss a computer system. They'll talk about a problem with the system. Then they go on to talk about a timetabling problem. One of them is going to suggest a way to solve the problem. Then the same person will also talk about a new system. And then they'll talk about the existing system. So you can see that the questions are designed to be fair and to guide the students through the conversation. This is really important because there's only one listening. Okay, when it comes to reviewing the answers, again, I would use this as an opportunity to focus on skills and to identify weak areas. So begin by asking the students to rate their confidence level. Then check their answers and discuss any problems. Self-study students can use the tape script to help them do this. And use the information you gather here to build up a picture of weak areas. Are your students mainly guessing when it comes to math completion tasks, for example? So do you then need to go back and look at the language that we use to locate a place or to give directions? Or are they mostly guessing when selecting from a longer list? Okay, and to go back to our poll question um, that we asked about listening, we asked whether you think spelling is less important in the listening test. Sorry, Alistair, have you got um, any the, responses yes. there? <laughs> the answers to this one are 85%, uh, oh sorry, hang on, in the listening test, 70% yes. disagreed. Disagreed, very good. And that's correct. Um, it's, it's just as important as in the writing test. Um, there is no difference. Um, I noticed earlier someone had put a comment up asking if I write all in capitals uh, for my my listening test answers, um, would this be marked correct or incorrect? And, and that, that would be fine. You're not testing anything to do with grammar in, in the listening test. We're only testing on their listening. So, um, but spelling is important because you can't decide just, well, just how wrong are you going to allow a spelling to be? So their the spelling is very important and you need to train your students to check their spelling carefully and to focus on this at the review stage as well. So when you're gathering this um, information about their weak areas, you might want to look at whether gap fill, uh, filling in the gaps in a sentence or in notes is where they're making a lot of errors and perhaps that's because of spelling problems that you need to work on. Um, the listening test practice materials can also be exploited in several different ways. And uh, you can do this Sorry, and you can do this by using the tape script at the back of the book to help you focus on language. This can be a great way of dealing with mixed ability classes, which I think can be fairly common in, um, in IELTS preparation because everyone is swimming in the same waters, as we said. Um, this first slide uh, shows how a part, of the, uh, shows a part of the tape script from one of the section three exercises in the book. And with your band four students, for example, you could ask them to listen. And as they listen, ask them to highlight the words and phrases where they think the speakers are making suggestions or negotiating, if that's what you want to focus on at that particular time. And this is what your band six or higher students could be. So here the teacher might type out a section of the script and blank out the same type of language that you asked your band four students to identify. And you can also exploit the listening resources to help with other skills. So for example, they could listen to a section two or four talk, make their own notes, and then they could use these notes to give the talk themselves. 
You could do the same with sections one and three, but ask pairs of students to role play a part of the conversation they hear. Integrating the skills this way can be a really good way of making sure they're practicing everything uh, that they need to practice and also making sure that they're getting some um, active practice of their speaking skills. Using the taped script, your students can follow the script as they listen and focus on different aspects of spoken language such as intonation, pronunciation, stress and chunking. This is especially useful for self-study students because they don't have a teacher to help correct or model these things. So the recordings can become their model. You could even just, uh, exploit the listening task for writing uh, with a diagram completion task. They could listen to make a note of key vocabulary and then try to produce a written description of the diagram. So there are lots of things you can do to exploit listening test practice materials. Okay, so we've dealt with the passive skills of listening and reading. Now let's look at the active skills where your students have to produce language rather than simply react to the language they're presented with. So first, writing skills. And these are the writing skills that we identified in the written paper of the test. And some of these are based on uh, specific tasks that the students need to complete, such as comparing and contrasting data, describing a map, or planning an essay. So those are clearly from uh, task one or task two. Others, uh, other skills here were identified by referring to the band descriptors that are used to, dis to, to assess the writing tasks. These essentially become your question types, if you like. So, for example, linking ideas, avoiding repetition, developing your ideas clearly, and so on. And you can find the public version of the band descriptors on the IELTS website, which is www.ielts.org. So there are four different criteria used to assess writing, and the first two are task response and coherence and cohesion. And these are areas that I think it's easy to overlook with lower levels because it's easier to work at the sentence level, correcting spelling or grammatical mistakes. At the lower levels, we generally begin with controlled practice. Uh, but this usually limits the practice to vocabulary and grammar. And those elements are reflected in the second two criteria, uh, grammatical accuracy and lexical resource. But be aware that this is only 50% of what they're being assessed on. So communicating relevant ideas clearly is a very important aspect to their answer. And the new book shows you ways to work on these areas. You then need to make sure that you provide plenty of opportunities to use and practice and develop these skills. Um, if your students aren't ready to take on a whole essay question, you could begin by giving them the introduction and conclusion to an essay and asking them to develop the ideas that are missing in between so that they complete the answer but make sure they do it in a logical way. Or you could give them everything except the introduction and conclusion and so then they need to find a way to begin the essay and to bring it to a logical conclusion. Once I felt that my students were ready for a greater level of free practice, this is what I would do. So first I would study the language areas they need for that particular writing task. And these will be different for writing task one and for writing task two. Though writing task one can look very complex, the fact that the students are being asked to describe visual information means that you can focus on quite specific language that they will need to use. So this is a good place to start. Next, I'd look at the questions with them, um, or the specific task that you, you're giving them, and discuss what that task is. I'd then focus on their ideas, and this can be a real stumbling block for some students, especially at the lower bands. So it could be a good idea to get them to discuss their ideas together in groups or as a class. The important elements here are making sure that the ideas are relevant and are key points, not minor details, and that they are organized logically. The next stage is to do some targeted language preparation. And this is where the element of help and guidance comes in. So it might be a list of words you'd like them to try to use. It could be language structures that will help them to organize their ideas. 
Next, I'd ask the students to actually write their responses. And I wouldn't focus on time at this early stage. It's important to build up the framework for how they should approach every task. And the final uh, stage I'd recommend is review. And review is really important. At a that in a minute. Okay, this is an example from the book of language study. And the exercises there are looking at different ways to improve your lexical resource score by avoiding repetition. Let's take a look at two writing task questions from the book and how you might discuss them with your class. So I'll give you a few seconds to look at them. And I imagine that your attention um, is going straight to these main areas here where the data is and over in the writing task. Um, if you look at this slide here, though, this is where you should be directing your students' attention when you're discussing the task, because this is the most important part of the question, actually. So you need to stress that the main task is explained in these highlighted areas. OK, in the first task, if they're distracted by statistics and immediately launch into describing them, they'll probably neglect to summarize the information and may forget to focus on selecting the main features and making comparisons. Similarly, for task two questions, if they immediately start to write about people who work for one company all of their lives, they may well neglect to discuss both views or give their own opinion or give reasons for their answer and include relevant examples. Uh, I'll just come back to the poll question we asked at the start. And we asked if you thought students should write as much as possible in the writing test. Well, the answer is yes. <laughs> Sorry, Alistair. 85% of people disagreed. OK, good. <laughs> uh, they should not write as much as possible. And I have heard people being advised to do that. And I think it's a really terrible thing to advise someone to do. The, um, they're told explicitly to write at least 150 words and 250 words in writing task two. And if they write as much as they possibly can, the chances are that in writing task one, they'll spend far more than 20 minutes on the task. And they will probably or most likely forget to do the important things, which is to organize the information and summarize it in the writing task as well they're far more likely to go off on all sorts of tangents and to be repetitive, which is not the right way to approach the task. OK, I'm speeding up a little bit now because I'm conscious of the time. <laughs> um, I just wanted to have a quick look at task response. Um, and you can see here that all of those features I just talked about are referred to in a band four task response descriptor. So. Uh, for the writing task one, the band four students attempt to address the task but don't cover the key fe features. They confuse key features with minor details. And they might include details that are irrelevant or inaccurate. And for task two, they respond only in a minimal way. Or their answers may go off on a tangent and not be related to the question. Their ideas may be repetitive, irrelevant, or not well supported. OK. I just quickly wanted to look at review and this idea of deliberate practice, which is something I've mentioned in uh, one of in in my advanced vocab uh, for IELTS book. If any of you have seen, you might have seen that term before. So these are um, examples of a band four candidate and a band six candidate, which are taken from the corpus. And I think we often talk about basic errors. And that's quite a misleading term. I think the term basic is a misleading one, to be honest. Um, we refer to basic errors as though these are errors only made at the lower levels, when I think, really, this is the language students learn at the very beginning, but they never really master all of the different nuances until they're at quite an advanced level. So here you can see a band four candidate. And they've used one plural noun correctly, computers then they incorrectly use the, the singular of bank and supermarket. Uh, the band six candidates correctly uses the plural for computers, students, and studies, but then at the end of the sentence incorrectly uses the singular computer. So what we call basic errors can occur even at band six. 
that's because there are other factors going on in the band four response, such as spelling, coherence, punctuation, and the inappropriate use of and etc. But errors like this could interfere with the band six candidate achieving their band seven goal, especially if they're more than a slip and they're noticeable. In the title here, I've referred to deliberate practice, and this is a term often used in sports coaching. And it's basically about recognizing a weak area and working repeatedly on it until you master it. And if you don't review your writing, I think you can't identify these weaknesses. And instead, what tends to happen is that you carry on deliberately practicing your mistakes, and these become a natural part of your language. So a review of writing is very important. Okay, finally, I'll skip to looking at how to exploit uh, the test materials. And here are some ideas you might be able to use. So as we said earlier, you can use the reading text as models to show how ideas are organized, how they're linked together, or to show how referencing works, and to find examples of supporting evidence. You can use the listening resources, as we've already seen, writing a description of the diagrams. And you can use ideas in the writing task, two questions, as a basis for discussion to help practice for your speaking test part three. Right, I haven't got an awful lot of time left for the speaking skills, so I will quickly go through that now. I'm so sorry. Um, so finally, let's look at speaking skills. So here on the screen at the moment, you're looking at the specific skills we identified for the speaking test. And again, this is from looking at the different parts of the test, as well as for the different descriptors. Um, so we work, they'll be working on um, talking about familiar topics from part one, giving a talk from part two, and talking about more abstract topics from part three, as well as fluency, coherence, accuracy, and pronunciation, and so on. Uh, what we're excited about with the new book is that we've included for the first time videos of speaking tests. And um, so we videoed four different mock tests using the same test materials, but featuring different candidates from band four to band seven and using different nationalities. And what we've tried to do is to show how the test works as well as how it's assessed. Um, there are exercises in the book to help you work through the videos and focus on different aspects of the candidate's performance. So, for example, here the focus is on part two and the ways that candidates handle keeping going for two minutes. I think students often feel very nervous about their speaking test. It's where they feel they're performing. And some students naturally lack confidence. So telling them to be more confident when they're in the speaking test isn't really very helpful advice. Instead, I tell my students to aim to be friendly. And hopefully, the videos will help take away a lot of that sense of anxiety and help them relax more. To go back to our poll questions, um, the final one we asked was whether you think that band four candidates won't understand a lot of the questions in the speaking test. In the video, your students can see how the different candidates handle questions where they aren't sure what to say. Sorry, Alistair, what did everyone respond? Okay, um, a quarter of people agreed, just under half disagreed, and about a quarter weren't sure. Okay, so what I'm hoping is within the video, you'll see that the examiner adapts the questions. Uh, again, the aim is to make this a fair test so that even at band four or five, the candidate is able to respond. And you'll see examples of that within the video. So they shouldn't go in there thinking that I'm only a band four or five, I'm not going to be able to do my best in this test. They will, they will be able to answer the questions. You'll also see examples of how the examiner tries to be as helpful as possible um, if they see the candidate is stuck and things like that. Okay, um, Alistair, we have, five minutes remaining, is that correct? Uh, yes, that's, that's correct, Pauline. I think we can, we can run on a, a couple of minutes beyond that, okay. I, I think, although people may have um, to, uh, to leave. Yes, I'm, I can um, skip a few things. I might just skip on and, and look at, um, I think dealing with test practice materials, you'll get the general idea now. Um, what we're talking about is gradually building up the students towards the full test practice. Um, so for speaking test, I would 
make sure to role play uh, the situation um, and to record their answers so that you can review and assess. And then again, work on those weak areas with the deliberate practice idea. Um, talking about the test fairness, which comes back to um, that question we asked in the poll. Here's an example of what the examiner asks um, uh, in, the, in this particular test. So you can see he says, now let's talk about writing. So he immediately signals uh, what the topic is about. What different types of writing do you do? For example, letters, emails, reports, or essays. So the candidate is given quite a bit of listening time there um, as he's talking. Um, and also lots of examples for the kind of thing he's talking about. And this is the way that the speaking test will unfold. If we look very quickly, if we can, at reviewing your student's performance, um, and I'll finish on this slide, I think, um, to look at how the band four, five candidate um, answered that particular question. And and, co and coherence. Um, it's actually quite difficult to do this, I realize, with just a written script, but I think you'll get the general idea. So at band five, uh, for fluency and coherence, we're told that they usually maintain a flow of speech, but use repetition, self-correction, and slow speech to keep um, going. So if you look at the candidate's response, um, this particular candidate said, I prefer to email. I prefer to connect uh, by email with my friends, with my family, and uh, sometimes I prefer to write letters by myself because uh, it's uh, mm, very actual. I think uh, it's from if you send a letter for you by yourself and uh, it means that you are, and so on. You get the idea there that the flow of speech is quite slow because of the self-correction and the repetition. So there is a, is a good um, example of a band five in terms of fluency and coherence. If we um, look over on the right-hand side at the band seven, at this level, they can speak at length without noticeable effort or loss of coherence. So the candidate here who is on the video says, well, for the view, and I often do essays, um, essay for exam or research with a group, letters. It, it happened only once. I had to write a letter for a job. I prefer writing with a computer because I can, um, I can pick up the main errors, the main mistakes, because the computer shows them to you and it's easier. And I'm reading that the way that the candidate actually produced the language. Um, it was in a very fluent way. So even though there, are, there is the occasional um and correction, there isn't any, any effort involved or loss of coherence and then able to keep going. Okay, I'm very conscious of the time. So I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Sorry that we didn't get to go through everything, but I don't actually have too many more slides left. And I do apologize if I speed it up far too much at the end to get through. Alistair. <laughs> thank, thanks very much, Pauline. That was fascinating. A lot to take in there, which is excellent. Yes, I know. <laughs> um, which we'll, we'll take a few questions. I'm aware that people are, are going to have to leave. Yes. Um, they'll be teaching and so on. But um, yes. first of all, um, question about listening papers. Um, are, these, yep. are these marked by, um, by hand, by human, or, or by computer? By human. Trained humans. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so, um, the question was from you, who's wondering if, if the answer would be, was for instance, huge, and that the student wrote enormous in the answer, would that be regarded as a mistake? No, because uh, there, there are, uh, there's lots of um, ways that we look at, uh, no, definitely by humans, so that we can take that sort of thing into account. Yes. Okay, thanks. Question from Gunnar Bergström, um, who's, um, and Gunnar's IELTS teaching sometimes uses the TED.com site for listening to interesting speeches yes. and letting students become used to understand different types of English accents. Um, do you think that's, that's useful? I think if you have to have very high level students. I, I, if any of you follow me on Twitter, I recommend texts um, through my Twitter account at Cullen Pauline. And I find it, I, it's very rare that I can recommend a little and I do, I suggest that they just listen to snatches of it. And I try to recommend ones where there is a tape script. 
um, and that's not always the case, especially with the TED lectures. Um, the problem is that when people talk like that, they're talking to that specific audience, and so there's a lot of assumed knowledge um, that we just don't have, and that adds a level of difficulty. And I also found there's often a lot of background noise. There might be music or, or something quite distracting. So they need to be very high level, I think, to cope with that sort of thing. Okay, thanks. Um, another question now. Um, do you have any tips on dealing with very mixed level classes? Um, so yeah, I, sorry. Yes, sorry. I, I did try to to deal that deal with that, but I don't uh, I don't know that it it came across as I wasn't able to spend as much time on it um, because I, I think basically you're they're all swimming in the same water as I suggested, but um, I think you do have to just give them different tasks and expect something different of them. Um, at, at the different stages, um, yeah. Especially with listening, I think you can divide up the tape script as I as I showed. Um, okay, thanks. And try and do it that way. Mm. Okay, um, we'll, we'll fit in a, a couple more. Um, yes. Someone asked about chunking. I noticed. I just yes. saw it going um, up, but I think so other people have answered. Yes, others have answered that. <laughs> yes. um, Dillian Caldwell asks about getting students to check each other's writing and suggest um, improvements. Do you, do you find that useful or does it put students in an awkward No, I, well, I think it does depend on your students. I think it's a great idea because um, especially if you have um, younger students, they love to find mistakes in someone else's writing, whereas they're not, um, they don't like to spend that time on their own writing, so it does get them reviewing. And if some, if a, if a student points out an error, I think they're more likely to say, "I don't believe you. Let me check." Whereas if a student does it, they can tend to just ignore what they're saying. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. And one, one final question. Um, just. Uh, Looking through so many questions, I'm really sorry that yes. we can't, um, can't answer. That's all. Um, for the academic reading module, um, yes. uh, Margaret Udo's students find it very difficult to handle that. Do you have any tips on what particular elements to focus on? What I what I tried to show there, and I think um, a lot of the problems that people can have is if you if you don't have authentic test materials, you can get the wrong impression, especially at those um, section one level of the text test, if you look back at the passage I showed you earlier, that's quite a manageable um, level, that section one reading. And I think it's really important to build up all of their skills at that sort of level first and use those same skills then with higher level texts. So don't progress to sections two and three until they've built up and practiced all of those skills. That's what I would recommend. I'd also tell them to not um, have too high an expectation. If they know going in, I am not a band eight or nine, <laughs> there are bound to be uh, questions that they, they can't answer that are above their level. That, that, that's the purpose of the test. It has to test at that higher range as well. Their, their whole aim going in should be to score the best that they can um, and to make sure they're making the most of the language skills and level that they do have. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs> I'm afraid we're going to have to finish there, but uh, yes. thank you so much, Pauline, for an absolutely no excellent problem. session. And, I'm so um, sorry for speeding up and not getting through. <laughs> I don't know, we'll, we'll work out, a, a, we'll talk to you about a, another way, perhaps, of, of addressing some more of those questions, because people yeah. do seem to have a lot of very interesting questions. It would be great to cover some of those. So yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll talk later about that. But um, that's all we've got time for today. But in, in four hours' time, we're running another webinar when Karen Elliott will be joining us for a session full of tips for anyone teaching Cambridge English young learners. And then next week, Chris Redston's offering advice on teaching speaking, that's on the 11th. And Sedef Kosh joins us on the 18th for advice on using technology with young learners. And you can sign up for all of those webinars on our news page at www.cambridge.org slash ELT slash news. I'll post that again into the chat. And if you want to catch up on any webinars you've missed, don't forget we've got a catch up page. Again, I'll post the link for that. And you can also check our YouTube channel and I'll, I'll post the link for that in the, in the chat as well. So thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Pauline, for an excellent session. And I hope to see thank you all you, again Alistair. for another webinar. Yes, thank you, Alistair. Thank you very much for all your help. Thanks very much, everybody. Okay, okay. bye, everybody. Bye.